topic back in the 70s, you know, before the doctrinal change. Um, but after, it, it just amazes me that it keeps coming up and coming up and coming up. Um, what do you think some of the misconceptions are that are out there that would make someone say that to a presidential candidate? You know, it's really interesting. Um, I was on a radio station in um, uh, Minnesota, and it was one of those early morning drive time talk things, and they invited me on to talk a little bit about Mormonism, and I thought, that's fine. And uh, it was pretty much an ambush, and it was was an ambush. He said, hey, the fellow said, I love Mormons, and Mormons are great, and Donnie Osmond's wonderful. But my friend here, who happens to be black, doesn't like Mormons at all, and let him let, let him tell you why. And he went on this this long discussion on how racist Mormons are. Um, and then we have this, as you brought up, we have this black clergy group demanding Romney renounces Mormonism because actually says they he calls publicly asked Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney to openly renounce his racist Mormon religion, Thanks. and. Um, uh, I think people look at us and they they see they see us as a white church, and they um, and I think a lot of the um, uh, you know pe- people uh, they believe that we uh, were segregated when that's really not the case. In fact, as many churches were segregated throughout American history. Our church never was. We were not segregated as a policy. I'm sure there could be some isolated wards somewhere that did things they weren't supposed to do, but but as a policy, that the, the church was never segregated. And we had members, active members of the church, all the way going all the way back to the 1830s. That but is... for whatever reason, people believe that we're racist. Um, granted, we had the policy of blacks not having the priesthood, and. Um, I have two thoughts on that. On one hand, you could say, well, if you look at all the congregations back in the 1950s and 1960s, it would be really hard-pressed to find any congregation that was white led by a black minister. You just wouldn't find it. On the other hand, our priesthood, being a lay priesthood, is so pervasive through the church. It's, it's part of the church. It's part of who we are and what we do it would have been very difficult to be a black man or a black woman in the LDS Church uh, prior to 1978, because the whole element was excluded to them. But but I get frustrated because the, um, uh, you know, we we, we have this constant drumbeat on how racist we are. Uh, We have um, critics of the church who keep this drumbeat up and feed the press articles, and we have these misconceptions about us being racist, um, when the the policy was changed thirty years ago, that's that's absolutely right. And one of the things that you and I were talking about earlier this afternoon is the fact that when that happens, they're actually applying a current set of beliefs or or belief systems against basically nineteenth century. Uh, or early 20th century views that were held in our church. And that's really not fair to isolate us because that's the way it was in virtually all churches, as you were just pointing out. That's why black Baptist churches happened, is because they were excluded from other Baptist churches. The same thing happened in the Presbyterian faith, Methodist faith. Right. Frank, Frankly, the Mormons were pretty early on the scene in some ways in allowing um, black members of of the church that happened, as you said, from the church's inception. Absolutely. We have to remember it was um, uh, the Loving versus Virginia case um, came up, I think it was, I believe it was in 1959, somewhere around that time. Um, We have the race riots at the University of Mississippi um, in 1962, where a black man was you know, attended, and they had huge riots. They had um, they closed the schools in Little Rock in 1958-59 uh, because black children were trying to attend. And my thought is, it wasn't a crowd of angry Mormons outside the schools in Little Rock trying to close them down. Racism really is an American problem, and it's it's in all faiths, it's in all groups. 
And I'll even say, you know, here I'm supposed to be defending Mormonism, that's what FAIR does, but racism also existed and exists within our church, within our group, because you take any group of people and put them out there, and there's going to be some elements of racism that we have to work on. But the church statements are such, in fact, the church just came out with a statement on it, uh, where, they, where they said, uh, it, it says, church statement regarding Washington Post article on race in the church, and it says, we condemn racism including any and all past racism by individuals both inside and outside the church. That seems pretty clear to me, that racism is not part of the church, should not be part of the church, and, uh, and we want to move forward. One of the more fascinating scriptures of the LDS faith is Doctrine and Covenant section 101. In verses 79 and 80, it says... It is not right that any man should be in bondage to another. Yes. And for this purpose, I've established the Constitution, and it goes on and on. Now, that was well before the Civil War, well before it was popular anywhere except in the North to renounce um, slavery, and yet here's an official tenant of the Church to do that very thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, I like the fact you quote that scripture because it shows how we as a people have grown. Because that scripture was, was given well before uh, we had some slaveholders who joined our church uh, from the Missouri area. And some of those slaves were brought, back, brought into Utah, and slavery became legal in Utah for a while. And yet that was in spite of that scripture. But there are other things we've done where we've done in spite of scriptures, and we've grown into it. I mean, the word of wisdom was given by way of advice first, and then now it's a commandment for us. Um, the, the Quorum of the Seventy was not organized the way it was organized in Scripture for quite some time until we finally got it done. And that seems to be how the Lord tends to do things with us. He kind of works with us and hopes we figure it out and, and gives us line upon line and precept on precept and helps us grow through our... our um, our difficulties and our unbelief. That is is very well stated. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up in our last little minute here, and perhaps we can talk about it on the other side of our break, is that there was definitely a time during the history of the LDS Church when uh, black members could not hold the priesthood and yet it is also very clear and you know I've done a little research and many others have done much more to show that there were in the early days of the church black priesthood holders I've counted up 10 individuals that I am um, entirely sure for most and very sure for for a couple of them that they held the priesthood in the very earliest days of the church and at least one of them was ordained by joseph smith so on, on the other side of of our break here which is coming up in about 10 seconds let's talk a little bit about how a church that would allow blacks into its priesthood somehow became one that didn't at least for a period of time stay tuned i'm martin tanner this is Religion Today. Today with Martin Tanner continues on KSL News Radio 102.7 FM and 1160 AM. We're back. I'm Martin Tanner. This is Religion Today. If you're just joining us, my guest is Scott Gordon. He's the president of FAIR. If you'd like to find them on the internet, it's fairlds.org. Great organization, has all kinds of information if you have a question about the LDS faith. And again, Scott, thanks for being with us. Thank you. We left with the question, how is it that the LDS church could be so forward-thinking and so different from virtually all the other churches in the 1830s and 40s by not only admitting blacks as members of the church, there were at least 22 black members of the church that I'm able to count up with the meager records that we have. And there were also almost half, about 10 of them, um, that I'm able to fairly well um, determine were priesthood holders. And so somehow 
after all that happened in the 1830s and 40s, the, the church had a policy, or some would say a doctrine. I don't believe that, and I guess you don't either, but how, how did that happen? Yes, it really is interesting, because we know that Joseph Smith, Parley P. Pratt, William Smith, and Orson Hyde all ordained blacks to the priesthood in the 1830s and 1840s. And we also know that Brigham Young was aware of those ordinations because he commented on them. Uh, so clearly that was going on. Uh, we also know one brother who acted as a branch president during those, that time period who happened to be black. Um, so it, 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 it's quite interesting. Uh, Elijah Abel is, seems to be the most famous black member that we have that most people are familiar with, although Walker Lewis was another one who was very famous and very involved in the Underground Railroad and, and um, has become a player in U.S. history, actually, where people can read about him. But, uh, you know, he was given a job of being, uh, you know, he was a carpenter, and he was given a job of being a mortician, and he was very concerned about that because that meant handling whites, their bodies and such. And Joseph Smith said, no, don't worry about it because I, cause it's, it, it'll be okay because this is a church thing and, 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 we're, and uh, if anybody has any problems, just come and talk to me about it. So we had a culture back then where people were concerned whether or not blacks were, uh, quite honestly, human. Uh, one of the popular books of the day, talked about, you know, was trying to explain where black blacks came from, and it, it, it in that popular book, uh, it actually, uh, you know, it, it um, argued that blacks came from Eve, you know, the, the whole Curse of Cain thing became uh, difficult for some people, because that would mean that blacks were actually human and sons of Adam, and so what they said is that Eve actually had an affair with the snake, and there, that's where blacks came from. And so there's really horrible, horrible things taught during that, those, those time periods um, that are just, I mean, terrible, where we had churches arguing over whether people were human, whether they could ever learn to read. We had churches, Presbyterian church split over slavery. The Methodist church did. The Baptist church did. The um, Southern Baptists, of course, are famous for splitting over the slavery issue. Um, the, uh, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention... That was in 1848, I guess they split. But it, it it was a time of great racism and such. And yet, our church actually accepted blacks. They, there was there was still prejudice. There was still racism there. But they accepted blacks and gave them uh, roles in the church. The uh, Nauvoo Temple had rules about who was invited into the church, and it specifically mentioned that uh, Hottentots, which are uh, which were Africans were invited to be in the church. And Elijah Abel talked about doing baptisms for the dead. And Jane Manning James was, was uh, looking forward to getting her, her temple work done and being sealed. And so we went from that, where it seemed to be quite open and, and uh, welcoming, to, as near as I can tell, about 1846 was the last uh, black man uh, that... Uh, well, actually, that's not quite true. We had, we had, we had 1846, we had one black man ordained, and then um, that was William McCary. And then we also had um, Elijah Abel's sons and grand, grandsons were also ordained. But other than the Elijah Abel um, line, uh, William McCary seems to be the last one or, ordained in about 1846. And then after that time, it stopped. And we're not really sure why. And I know some people think, well, there's these scriptures and the Prolegate Price is why, but that argument didn't come up until B.H. Roberts um, brought it up in 1885, which said, and he essentially said, well, maybe this is the reason they can't. So he brought it up more as an explanation, as a possible explanation, than as a uh, justification, I mean, than rather the brethren bring up a justification to begin with. And even at that, if we look at the scriptures in um, the book of Abraham and the book of Moses, you find that it doesn't really say what people have kind of assumed it said for a long time. It was it, it's a stretch to make the scriptures uh, say those things or, or say it's even about priesthood and blacks and such because it doesn't. It's not about that. This whole idea of, um, of of racism at the time or somehow justifying a, a policy yes. to, to me seems to be. 
what was going on it, it, because you can't go back and find some revelation. You can't find an official statement of the church that, okay, this question has now arisen, and from here on out, this is what the Lord has told us to do. There's nothing like that. It just somehow happened. And, and during our break, you and I were talking about some of the different ideas about where it came from, but the real answer is we really don't know. Part of it may have been the pressure that was brought to bear on the church for many reasons, and uh, ordaining more and more black members of the church might have increased that, but who knows? It may have been something entirely separate. Right. When I mean, if, if, if you look at Wikipedia, even it talks, and you look up the curse of Cain, it talks extensively about the Mormon church's belief on how this is why blacks couldn't have the priesthood. The only problem with that conversation is the idea of the curse of Cain didn't come from Mormon prophets. It didn't even come from Mormon apostles. It's been around for many hundreds of years prior to our church ever existing. It was the Protestants used that argument to about the curse of Cain um, to justify slavery. And then that argument changed and people started thinking about it. Well, there was a flood, so how did, that, how did Cain's descendants get through the flood? So they changed that argument to, to start talking about the curse of Ham, uh, Ham being one of Noah's sons, and somehow he brought that curse through. And so the Protestants kind of changed their discussion from curse of Cain to curse of Ham. What I see is in our church, we ended up being a little more isolated, and so we kind of hung on to the old discussion of curse of Cain because we weren't interacting so much with everybody else. We kind of went off to Utah, which very isolated at the time. Um, and we continued talking about curse of Cain. And then, and then we came up with a new argument that maybe somehow people were neutral in the pre-existence or less valiant in the pre-existence. And Brigham Young himself, back in those days, Brigham Young said, no, that's not the case. If you were here, you were valiant. Um, and yet, even though Brigham Young said that, that thought and that teaching continued on among the members of our church for a long time in such, such a way that we even have some of the um, leaders of the church uh, in writing their books and such. They wrote those, those items down. And I know when I was younger, I heard about the less valiant theory more than once. And I remember going to my father and saying, is that true? And my dad said, no, that's absolutely not true, but a lot of people believe it. Um, so, yeah. so in our last minute or so here, yeah. tell us where this leaves the church today. The church has made extraordinary efforts to make black members feel welcome. Yes, and it's important that we as members don't repeat the curse of Cain and, or curse of Ham or, or the less valiant theories, because as Bruce Homer Conkey said, you know, that's forget everything we said in the past in this, because we, we didn't know any better. We didn't have any revelations in that area. And those are just made up, and we made those up as explanations, but they weren't really the explanation. So it's important for us to be welcoming and to point out, when the press brings these things up, point out that blacks are welcome in our church. African Americans do have the priesthood and do have leadership uh, positions. And, and to make sure that we're not saying things so that we're part of the problem, we're, that we are continuing some of these false thoughts and false theories about why blacks couldn't have the priesthood. Okay. Scott Gordon, thank you for joining us this week on Religion Today.